Hey, what's up everybody? This is GW Fox. At the beginning of 2020, I wanted to do a deep dive on finance. Um, and then when COVID hit, that gave me the perfect excuse. So this was an off and on project over the last six or seven months. And I first started uh, when I picked up a book last year uh, called The Die Broke. And even though it came out 20 years ago, I think it's just as apt today as it was 20 years ago. Um, it's a book about adjusting your viewpoint on how you make money, how you spend it, and how you will spend it in retirement, how you give it to your kids, that kind of thing. So that, that definitely kicked me off and got me going. And so I came upon If You Can by William Bernstein. And it laid out reading seven books by well-respected authors. And these books are uh, well-respected as well. And he basically said, if you read these books, you'll know more than 90% of most financial advisors. And obviously you have to take that with some of a grain of salt. Uh, if you can, it's free, by the way, via PDF. So uh, definitely check that out and take a look at that. And I really just wanted to go over what I learned, the main takeaways, and uh, give you access to the notes I took for each of the books that's going to be down in the description below along with all the names of the books in If, we, in if You Can. And I really think that they're worth taking a look at. I'll highlight my thoughts, you know, here in this video uh, about what I think are the most important books to read, but let's just start off with the main takeaways. So main takeaways are, what is the profile of an overconfident investor? A male professional with at least one advanced degree. Nice to meet you. So uh, I definitely fill that void and I have made mistakes in investing. Absolutely, that is a big reason that got me into wanting to learn as much as I can about finance and overall wealth building. Not necessarily day trading or options trading, but just building wealth over time. So when should you get in the market? Now, yesterday, if you can, uh, immediately. It's not about timing the market. It's about time in the market. Um, yeah, if you have some money to set aside to do so, even with like a Roth IRA or an IRA, just try and put as much as you can aside and um, uh, as soon as possible. So save, save as much as you can. Uh, the old adage is like 10% of your, your paycheck, but I feel like that's too low. I think realistically you want to put in at least a quarter if you can, um, especially if you're single. If you have a family, I know you might have other expenses. You're looking to buy a home, uh, for rent, pay for your kids, obviously that's it. But if you're single, definitely put away at least 25% of your net income. Obviously remember to save, uh, put some money saved aside for taxes each year, but try and save a minimum of 25%. There's actually a movement called FIRE uh, that aims to save 70%. So it's like financial investment, retire early, something like that, and they wanna save 70%. That's a little bit extreme, but I think 25% is absolutely doable. Uh, so let's get into the nitty gritty, right? cost is your biggest enemy that is the main throughput of all of those books every book is that when you are investing you want to choose the lowest cost investment so um, basically there's no high cost fund that will ever beat a low cost fund of like funds right so if you're looking for an overall s p 500 fund if you have a low cost and a high cost the low cost will always outperform it simply because those extra uh, percentages over time lead to a lot of money. So um, index funds are generally what get recommended most in these books. Uh, it's, it's just something that's easy, simple, and encompasses a lot. Um, risk. So you want to diversify by owning a total stock market fund, total international stock market fund, and a total bond market fund. Now those are three that are across all the books. That's what they recommend. In fact, one book, uh, How a Second Greater, Greater Beat Wall Street, is that's the whole book, is how he beat Wall Street with just those three funds and a different breakdown. Um, it's a powerful tool, especially over 30 years. Um, 
total stock market fund should basically be the majority of it. Uh, then you can diversify with uh, the international stock market fund and the bond fund as lesser percentages, depending on what you want to do. That's if you just want the most basic portfolio. The other books do go into uh, more advanced portfolios, especially the final book all about asset allocation. Um, don't use a financial advisor. Every book says this because one or two percent uh, from a financial advisor over 30 years is ridiculous. So just think about uh, this example, right? So over 40 years, you have $10 invested. At 10%, that would yield $45. So your $10 would yield $45. At 8%, it would only yield $22. So at just 2% less, it would yield less than half. And account another 2% if you have high turnover, or high taxes, uh, that will yield just $10. So Low cost is always gonna be it. Um, not using a financial advisor is always gonna be it. It's always gonna be better to spend your spend the time yourself. Um, how to, uh, the millionaire next door is a, provides a really good example of the average person who spends, like the person who's frugal and is a millionaire, spends about eight to 10 hours every month doing that, where the uh, underachiever spends less than four hours a month. That's not a big difference. That's, that's eight hours of your time every month going over your portfolio and making sure everything's going well. That's not a huge investment. Um, don't own individual stocks, at least not more than 10% of your total fund or your total portfolio, right? So basically you want to have everything else in less risky, uh, consistent producers and then 10% or less of individual stocks. My current portfolio, I have about 4% in individual stocks, but I purchased those with the assumption that they were long-term. I plan on holding those stocks long term. A huge stock right now that everyone's buying long term is Tesla because they're absolutely disrupting the EV market. Makes sense to hold that long term. Don't try and get into the day trading of these stocks. If you're going to get stocks, buy them long term. But even a portfolio with 100 different stocks isn't going to be as diverse as holding a total stock market fund like the, uh, I think it's called the Wilshire 5000, right? That's that's a lot. So it's always gonna be better to get a fund or an index fund, a mutual fund, index fund with a broad market as your main driver, right? Um, allocate assets properly. Again, make sure that you have a total stock market fund. If you want a growth fund, if you want a mid cap, make sure they're properly allocated. You, again, for my portfolio, again, this is my portfolio. This isn't meant to be for anybody else's, but my portfolio generally has 60% of it is like in safer funds. Less risk, they're always gonna get a certain percentage year over year, and that's what I want. Then I've doled out 10%, 10%, 10% in slightly riskier, but more um, diverse funds, right? So they shouldn't have a high correlation with each other either. So if you have four or five funds and they all go up and the stock market goes up, that, that's not great. So correlation is negative one to positive one. If at all possible, you want them to be as close to negative one as possible. In reality, that's not really feasible, right? So you just want the lowest correlation as possible. So if you've got a, a couple like your main one, um, just just for example, is VU, right? It's a VOO. Um, you don't want to get ones that overlap with that, right? You don't want to have a lot of overlapping investments. So try and diversify in different things that have a low correlation. Um, KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. Um, basically, the simpler your portfolio, the better. Uh, having more than five funds actually <laughs> reduces your chances of um, keeping pace with the market long term. Uh, it's really just the simpler, the better. Um, because I have two separate accounts, I can't get the same like fund for my main fund in both. Uh, that's just not how they operate. So I chose two comparable ones. Uh, you wanna think of your portfolio, even if you have separate accounts, as one unit, right? So all of your investments are one entity. Um, and so you wanna just keep it as simple as possible. Uh, 401k, IRA, you should be maxing that out, if at all possible, constantly. Take a look at your 401k. There's some crazy stats out there in these books. 
that basically say like 72% or 77% of people don't even look at their, their 401ks or IRAs through their company and have no idea what's going on with that. Uh, case in point, I recently uh, took a look with my friend at his and they had him in 16 different funds. They also had him 20% invested in his own company, which due to COVID was down 40% this year. That's terrible. So take a look at your 401k. Make sure you know it's going into something that you approve. Um, be invested in that. Don't just put your money in your 401k and, and not think about it. Put your money in and know. Also, on that 401k note, never have more than 10% of your money in a company that you're with. That's just too much risk because if you get fired or your company is the next Enron, not only do you lose your job, but then you just lose all the, the, the wealth with it because your stock goes to zero. So any company can be the next Enron. I know nobody likes to believe that, but it's true. Um, net, moving on. Are you in the right occupation? Is your job going to be viable in the future? Uh, all this financial knowledge doesn't matter. It's pointless if you don't have any money, right? Um, uh, one of the books, The Great Depression, it's a, it's a diary of the Depression era through the eyes of a lawyer who really, um, his main takeaway was that he, he followed the market so well and he's like, oh man, if I had money, I would totally invest now. But he didn't have any money saved away, right? So you do want to keep a certain amount of cash so that when things drop down, you can invest. Um, Having the right occupation matters. It's, it's one of the biggest decisions we as humans make, right? It is, what do I want to do for a living? But you have to look into, you know, occupations that are going to be viable in the future. In my life, I'm in my mid-30s right now. So we've had that dot-com boom. The internet has become a thing as we were growing up. And if you're in any of that cloud, uh, computer engineering, all of that, those are all just such viable, right? Um, futures for you. Make sure you're in a position to build wealth, have this knowledge and choose a occupation that will provide you 30, 40 years of, of, uh, safe stability, safe, stable work. Right. Um, the final point, right, is called regression to the mean. And this is brought up in many of the books. Um, over time, no matter how good you are, you'll never beat the market. So the idea, the idea is that if a fund is good or a fund is bad, they, were, they will always regress and meet in the middle and meet to the mean, right? Main point is your goal is not to beat the market. It is to capture 99.99% of the market's return over 30 years, right? So you don't want to beat it. Uh, that, that's not necessarily your goal. You want to match it as much as possible after expenses, after taxes, over 30 years. So you're not trying to time it. You're trying to get in. Um, so again, just as a, another example, these are notes from these books. This is what I have taken from these books and I'm just putting it in a video. Uh, this is not meant to constitute financial advice. I'm not giving you my portfolio. I'm not saying what percentages are. Uh, there's two books that will lay that out for you. Um, Millionaire Next Door and How a Second Grader Beat Wall Street, I think are the two required readings from uh, William Bernstein's If We Can pamphlet, or If You Can pamphlet. I think that they are the best layman's terms books of breaking down everything in a super simple manner and making it easy to comprehend and show you how viable investing is and that it should be done. Definitely. Um, yeah. So those two books really just hammer home how important this is. Uh, but I'll, I'll go through all the books again. I wrote, uh, I read die broke, um, last year and that's kind of what got my mind churning. Um, the philosophy is basically this, uh, save your money and grow your wealth as you age, you know, while treating yourself and helping your children, children when they need it. So it's not thinking about, oh, they're going to get this big inheritance when I die. Usually that ends up messy, especially if there's multiple kids, especially if you forget to make a will or a trust. So it's help your children when you can. Then when you hit 65 and 70, you start matching your income like with annuities or a reverse mortgage to uh, support your uh, lifestyle as you age and provide you with long-term care. Um, 
you know, the, the, the quote on the back of the book, and he says this all the time, is, uh, it's by Mark Levine, uh, says, the last check you should ever write should be to the undertaker and it should bounce. So you can't take money with you. And if you're leaving it to your kids at the end, that usually creates a lot of issues on why certain kids got more or less or whatever. Uh, hey, if you can give your kids that money or give a charity that money while you're living and still live comfortably until you pass, you should do that. Um, first, first thing, read William Bernstein's, if you can, 16 page PDF. Read it, it's got a lot of good information. I followed it to the T. Um, it has already paid off greatly for me. Uh, to, to say that lightly, it's made me significant amounts of money because I had money to invest um, from saving for my whole life, um, from budgeting well, uh, putting my money, I started it at the beginning of the year and following this guidance, I, I put in money as I learned and as I read these books. And it's made me quite a bit of money already. Um, gr granted, after the initial COVID scare, uh, it, the market rebounded, but it still had some ups and downs. And so I, I have a couple of riskier things, but my risk, my safest investments have made me the most money. So definitely really look into choose. Personally, I've been going with Vanguard funds because they're dirt cheap. <laughs> Their expense ratio ratios are very low, very, very low. And on top of that, they have low turnover. So better for taxes, right? So they check all the boxes. Um, read William Bernstein's if you can. It, it, it highlights everything. It's what I followed. It's what this, this whole video is about. Uh, the Million Next Do Millionaire Next Door by Thomas Stanley. Um, again, I listed as a required book. It shows the habits and profiles who are current millionaires. It's great. Uh, there is a wealth calculator that will scare the shit out of most of you. 95% of you, I guarantee you, will put in the numbers of how old you are, how much money you made last year, and how much uh, money you should have, wealth you should have accumulated. And if you are hitting it, you're in the top like 5%, no joke. Um, it's scary. Um, this paired with Die Broke was good, but I think you could just read The Millionaire Next Door. Uh, next book, Common Sense on Mutual Funds by uh, John C. Bogle, who's the creator of Vanguard. Um, this is the one of the driest books, but it's probably the book I learned the most on in terms of just cost. This is the whole book is just where he hammers home cost and how important that is. And he uses a ton of different examples for how dry the subject is. It's really well written and it really highlights a lot of easy stuff, gives a ton of examples of how cost plays a huge factor and it is the driving force of how you should choose funds. Uh, really great. Um, and how you should be in the market long term, minimum of 10 years, but really over a 20 to 30 year span is how you build wealth. Uh, they talk about, the main point is that they talk about the miracle of compounding, and I think it's the tyranny of compounding. So uh, compound interest, right? Um, the next book is The Great Depression, A Diary by Benjamin Roth. I mentioned it earlier. It is, um, I love history. History is one of my favorite subjects. I love learning about it. And it is fascinating, super easy to read, but it's one of the few books where they had the author, you know, he, as he was living, he took notes on stocks as they were happening in this town of Youngston, Ohio. And so uh, it, it's, it's crazy how he was able to call. He himself learned a ton about booms and busts of all the financial books from the, last, the previous 50 years. And so he was able to glean so much information, but because he was an attorney, the attorneys and dentists and doctors of that era never really recovered. They, they stayed for like a 14, 15 year period of barely skating by. And because he didn't have money, he was not able to invest. Um, great book, super easy read, highly recommended. Uh, Devil Take the Hide Most by Edward Chancellor. It is a history of speculation starting in ancient ancient times throughout like 1500 to current times. It's fascinating, it's a great historical book, and it's a, basically about how greed eventually over, greed and lack of um, regulation overtook humans and caused immense highs and immediate crashes and lows after that. Uh, it's a fascinating book. And I, again, all these books, there's a reason why he rec Bernstein recommends these books. They're all great. <laughs> They're all really good and different. Um, then we got 
how a second grader beat Wall Street. So the fund he used was 60% total stock market, 30% total international um, uh, stock market fund, and a total bond fund. Those were the three at 60%, uh, 30%, and 10%. And that fund with the three Vanguard funds of, um, uh, again, this book was written 20 years ago, so it's a little outdated, but it was basically Vanguard's total stock market fund, Vanguard's total international stock market fund, and I think it was just BND, their, totals, uh, their total bond market fund. And that consistently beat the market, or excuse me, that beat the market over like a three year period um, every year. It, beat the, it outperformed the market by just those three funds. So it shows how powerful a simple portfolio can be. Um, yeah, it, it, it's it's layman, layman's terms books, read it. That with Millionaire Next Door, required reading. Um, your Money in Your Brain by Jason Zweig, Zweig I, I'm, I'm guessing it's Zweig. Uh, it takes a deep dive in how you act when you are gambling and investing and how your mind plays tricks on itself and um, contradicts itself and makes you act irrationally. And it's, it's one of the few things in life where your comprehension, your brain doesn't know how to handle the highs and lows of investing. Uh, it's fascinating read and the most important parts I think at their end are at the end on how to counteract these feelings. How risky is everything for you? A big thing he talks about is how risk investment, um, excuse me, risk tests uh, for how risky a portfolio can be are basically useless until, uh, because it's all based on mood. So the only way you can really fairly assess risk is to go, okay, if I have a 50-50 portfolio and um, uh, this drops by this much, would I be okay with it? If I have a 70 30 portfolio and one of the, the funds drops by this much, can I be okay with it? You really have to do a step-by-step -step process and judge on your own how, how invested you can be in all of this. Um, it's fascinating. Definitely read it. I took the best notes I can on it. There's a ton of case studies that he uses that I obviously weren't, weren't, uh, didn't have time to copy and put into the notes. There's so many different examples that he uses on human behavior that I think is paramount and should, it's an essential book, it should be read. Uh, final book, all about asset allocation is exactly how it sounds. Uh, what are the best portfolios for you and at what age? He lists four defined age groups, so it's like early people to up to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 75 and 75 and beyond, right? And um, how, again, goes over how risky, what you should have weighted where, what's the best advanced portfolio versus the best basic portfolio, uh, what's the best for taxes, what's all, it, it, it's, it's a dry book, but it really lays out everything very simply. Um, I did my, as best as I could in the notes, but you know, it, all these books should be read. Um, uh, the no my notes are very good and detailed in most parts, but some of these books aren't really, um, you aren't able to take good notes because it's just a lot of anecdotal stuff. Uh, finally, give your, give, if, if you're just getting into this, check out the subreddits on finance, um, uh, stocks, personal finance, and financial independence. Uh, FIRE is financial independence, retire early, right? Okay, so um, st stupid simple stuff. They even have a, a link um, that I'll, I'll provide uh, that's basically a Reddit link where it's just like, stick my money somewhere where you don't have to think, hey, here's where you should stick your money if you just want to set it and forget it. Again, I don't recommend that, but it's there. Um, I also watched a video series by Preston Pish called Stock, Invest Stock Investing Like Warren Buffett. Uh, it's a short YouTube series. I took notes on it. Um, uh, it's, it's more for evaluating individual stocks. Uh, like Warren Buffett and how you do that. There's four simple ratios that you can use that are really powerful. Um, that, you know, price, price to book uh, value, price earnings ratio, current ratio, and I apologize, but I'm blanking on the last one, but it, it, they're just super simple tools on how to look at a company. If you're gonna invest in individual stocks, you should know everything about that stock, how they make money, will they be make, making money in 30 years? Uh, essentially Warren Buffett, when he invests in a company or buys stock, he plans on holding that stock for 30 years or until the company doesn't exist anymore, right? Will this company be around in 30 years, in 50 years, in 100 years? So it's a lot of good information. Um, so 
All these notes and stuff like that are gonna be down below in the description. Uh, I'm just gonna link a Google Docs to it. I'm, I'm just putting all this stuff in there. Um, with, if you can, there's a, an Excel spreadsheet and something else on wealth calculator and how to get where you need to go. All this stuff's really useful. It's eye-opening. It's um, it's a little worrying. I, I went to business, business school and took finance classes. None of this was taught. Uh, personal finance is one of those things that just I feel like isn't talked about enough and Reading this pamphlet and getting started is a huge tool for you. Doesn't matter how old you are, okay? It, there's levels for everybody. You should be wanting to learn this stuff. If you're watching this video all the way through, I thank you. Um, I'm just, I sent this out to all my friends. I've talked with all my friends about this. Uh, I sent it out to a lot of people that I think could use this information and we've had discussions about it. It's not a simple topic. It's something that's hard to get into and be focused on. But once you do, and once you have command of your money, you will see it grow. You will see over time that your decisions have made uh, made an impact. Again, this isn't financial advice, not that I really gave any anyways. This was the main topics that I gleaned from reading these books and following William Bernstein's advice. So I highly recommend that you do the same. Have a good one.